morning, everyone, and welcome to this joint webinar of OECD and DIW Berlin on taxing inheritance, uh, a way to raise revenues and curb wealth inequality. My name is Matthias Rumpf. I'm the deputy head of the OECD Berlin Center, and I have the pleasure to be your host today. Um, if you're worried about growing income inequality, you did not have a closer look at wealth. Wealth is distributed much more unequally than income and wealth concentration has increased in many OECD countries over the past decades. But more and more of this accumulated wealth is passed on to the next generation, which is only amplifying existing inequalities. On the other hand, taxing wealth in a just and efficient way is much more difficult than taxing income. This is one of the reasons why the OECD has looked at a promising way to tax wealth, which is when it is passed on to the next generation. I am grateful that we are joined today uh, by two authors of uh, the study by the OECD on taxing inheritance. And please welcome with me uh, Bethany Miller Powell and uh, Sarah Parrott. Both of them work at the OECD tax, uh, OECD Center for Tax Policy and Administration. And they will present today a report which has been published, I think, one or two months ago, and we will have the opportunity today to discuss it uh, more closely in the German context. Um, and no presentation without discussion at our webinars. So I'm also happy that we are joined today by Roland Franke, who is the head of tax and fiscal policy at the German Foundation for Family Business, Businesses, an organization rep rep which represents as the name suggests, family-owned businesses um, in Germany. That, uh, there are, as many of you know, quite a few in Germany uh, of those uh, kind of uh, uh, companies. And some of them belong to the crown jewels of the German economy. We are also joined by Stefan Bach, who is a professor of economics and the leading, if not the leading tax expert at the German Institute for Economic Research, DIW Berlin. As always, after the presentation, we will have a discussion, which you also can uh, join, where you also can participate. Please use uh, the chat function of the Zoom application for your questions and comments, and we will try to make sure that they are included in the discussion uh, uh, in the second part. Some of you might remember that we, we used to do these events in Berlin as Berlin lunchtime series with ample opportunity for networking over lunch after the presentations. We hope this will be possible again soon, but for this digital event, we wanted to provide an arguably incomplete replacement for those lunch discussions. This is why we thought that the, part, the last 20 minutes of uh, this event will be reserved uh, for more informal discussions with the panelists, uh, which will all wait for you in separate breakout rooms which you can join um, in the later part of, the, of this event. Uh, and um, we can't offer lunch, of course, but um, we will hope that uh, you will enjoy the discussion nevertheless. I should also tell you that this plenary session will be recorded and the recording will be published on our blog together with all the presentations we will have today. But now, without further ado, Bethany and Sarah, you have the floor for your presentation. Uh, please. Um, thank you very much, uh, Matthias, and, and thank you for, for this invitation to present um, our report on inheritance taxation in OECD countries. Um, we're both very pleased to be able to present this work to you today. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as Matthias mentioned, it's a recent report. It was released um, in May. And the purpose of the report is twofold. So it compares and assesses inheritance, estate and gift taxes across OECD countries. And it explores the role that these taxes could play in raising revenue, in addressing inequalities and in improving the efficiency of tax systems. Um, it's important to mention as well that this report is part of a broader work stream um, at the OECD on capital taxation. Um, that's an area where we've been doing a lot of work on in, in recent years. In particular, we released two big reports in 2018, um, one on the taxation of household savings and another one on the role in the design of net wealth taxes. And so this report on inheritance taxation is a significant addition to our previous work. 
Next slide, please. Uh, so the, the structure of the presentation is going to be very close to the structure of the report itself. And we'll start with some data on wealth and inheritances, um, which is what the first chapter of our report does. And so this slide shows um, total net wealth held by the top 10% and the top 1% in different OECD countries. And you can also see um, the OECD average highlighted on the graph. And so what we see generally is that the distribution of wealth, as Matthias was saying, is highly unequal. It's highly uh, concentrated at the top of the distribution. And so for the OECD on average, uh, more than half of total household wealth. So here you see 52% of wealth is held by the top 10% and about 20% of total wealth is held by the top 1%. Now you also see variation across countries and you see that in some countries, wealth is uh, more unequally distributed than in others. And in fact, Germany is among the countries um, with a comparatively high degree of wealth inequality. So to, to give you the German figures, um, in Germany, the top 10% holds about 60% of total household wealth, and the top 1% holds about a quarter of total household wealth. So highly unequal distribution of wealth. Uh, next slide, please. So if we look at inheritances more specifically, they are also um, unequally distributed, uh, with the wealthiest households receiving far greater inheritances than other households. And in general, across countries, um, the inheritances and the gifts that are reported by the top 20% are about 50 times larger than the gifts and the inheritances reported by the bottom 20%. Now, if we look at Germany on this slide, you, you can see that the average value of inheritances increases steadily um, until the, the fifth quintile, so the top 20%, where you see a big jump in the average value of inheritances. And so this unequal distribution of inheritances and gifts is likely to further um, reinforce the, the wealth inequality that uh, we were just talking about. Next slide, please. Now, if, if we look at trends over time, um, we see that in some countries, inheritances um, have become more important as a share of private wealth. And that's been the case in Germany very clearly. Uh, Germany, unfortunately, on this slide is, is the very light uh, blue line, but you can still see it. And you see a very clear U-shaped pattern with a decline in the importance of inheritances um, in the first half of the 20th century until the mid-70s, and then again an increase in the importance of inheritances as a share of private wealth. There are similar patterns in the UK and in France, for example, but um, less um, striking than in, in Germany. Um, in the future, we also expect inheritances to continue to increase in value um, if we see a continuing trend in asset prices. Um, but we also expect them to increase in number given that the baby boom generation is getting older. Other trends that we anticipate is that wealth is going to be increasingly concentrated um, among older people because people are living longer. And inheritances are going to be split between fewer heirs just because fertility rates have gone down. And so if you combine all of these trends in the future, we expect that this could further reinforce inequality. Uh, next slide, please. So the second chapter, now that we have this background, uh, the second chapter of the report reviews the arguments for and against inheritance taxes from an equity and efficiency and an administrative perspective. And it's largely based on existing theoretical um, and empirical literature. And we'll start with the arguments in favor and then we'll move to the arguments against. Um, the main argument probably for an inheritance tax is that it can enhance the quality of opportunity, which can be understood as making sure that people who have the same levels of skills and put in the same level of effort uh, face the same prospects in life. And indeed, with an inheritance tax, uh, you'll have smaller differences between the people who receive a lot from their parents and people who receive little. Um, and so that helps ensure that people start off on a more equal footing. A second key argument is that it can reduce wealth inequality, especially in the long run and if revenues are redistributed. Now, um, there's interesting research showing that um, receiving an inheritance can actually be equalizing uh, because, and that can be pretty counterintuitive, 
But the reason for that is because even if in absolute terms, poorer households will receive uh, smaller inheritances, they will receive larger inheritances than other households as a share of their initial wealth. And so that has an equalizing effect. Um, but this is only in the short term because poorer households also tend to consume much more quickly their inheritances. So in the long run, receiving an inheritance is disequalizing. Um, and inheritance taxes are equalizing. And especially if you take into account that revenues are redistributed. Um, we also show with some simple simulations in the report that an inheritance tax can be a very useful tool to prevent excessive um, wealth accumulation over generations. There's also evidence that inheritance taxes can encourage potential heirs to work harder and to save more simply because they might have to compensate for the fact that they'll receive less as an inheritance if there's a tax. Um, there's evidence showing that levying an inheritance tax with an exemption for charitable giving encourages charitable donations. Another argument is that negative externalities from wealth concentration might strengthen the case for inheritance taxes. And then finally, the report highlights the fact that inheritance taxes have a number of administrative advantages over other forms of wealth taxation, in particular over net wealth taxes that are levied every year. And the main reason for that is because inheritance and gift taxes are levied infrequently, but also because they are levied at a time when assets need to be valued anyway. Um, identifying ownership is also likely to be easier under an inheritance tax than under other taxes because the beneficiary of an inheritance has a strong incentive to make sure that the transfer of ownership is done properly and clearly to uh, guarantee their ownership rights. Um, so that's what we highlight also in the report. Next slide, please. There are also uh, arguments against, of course, inheritance taxes. And a key one is that an inheritance tax might discourage donors from working and saving um, because part of their wealth will be taxed when it passes on to the next generation. And passing on wealth to the next generation might have been the precise reason why donors were working and saving in the first place. Um, in theory, there's a, so that's a possible effect. In theory, there's another effect. You could also imagine a household that a donor that has uh, his mindset on passing on a certain amount of wealth to the next generation. And if there is an inheritance tax could be encouraged to save even more to compensate for the fact that the heir will have to pay inheritance tax. So those are the two theoretical effects. Empirically, unfortunately, there's little evidence, uh, but generally, the studies show small, um, negative, but small effects of inheritance taxes on donors' wealth accumulation. And these effects tend to be smaller, inheritance taxes tend to have smaller distortive effects than other taxes on the wealthy. Another concern is migration responses to inheritance taxes. So the idea that people might relocate to another country or another region in response to an inheritance tax. Empirically, migration responses tend to be limited with the exception of the very, very top of the distribution. Um, so it is an issue, but at the very top. And we highlight in the report how this can be addressed through specific measures. So specific measures can be put in place to limit these behaviors. Another big concern is that inheritance taxes might negatively affect entrepreneurship and family business successions. Um, with family business successions, the concern is that an inheritance tax might jeopardize family businesses if they don't have enough liquid assets to pay for the tax when the business is transferred. Now, again, empirically, there isn't um, a lot of evidence directly linking inheritance taxes with these types of liquidity issues. So we do not have solid empirical evidence as to how widespread this issue is. On the other hand, there's a lot of evidence showing that when heirs inherit a business, say from their, their parents, they tend to underperform. They tend to be less skilled at managing the business than their predecessors. Um, so that means that even if inheritance taxes might negatively affect family-owned businesses, which again, we don't have much evidence of, it could also ensure at the same time, uh, it could reduce the risk that we misallocate capital to less skilled heirs compared to other potential uh, business owners. But in general, Bethany will explain that these concerns have led to very generous provisions for uh, business assets under inheritance and, and estate taxes. Another big argument is that inheritance taxes can easily be avoided. And indeed, there's a lot of evidence of tax planning and tax avoidance, but this is largely the result of how these taxes have been designed. So instead of being an argument for repealing these taxes, it should be an argument for designing them better. And then a final point and a very common 
and concern um, is that inheritance taxes can lead to double taxation. Uh, but we show in the report that this tends to be a weak argument. It's a weak argument because um, um, it's far from unique to inheritance taxes. In fact, VAT is most likely double taxation because you pay it with post-tax income. Um, a second key argument is that um, from an economic point of view, it's not the number of times that you tax something that matters, but it's the overall level of taxation. And then finally, it really depends on whose perspective you view it from. But if you view it from the perspective of the recipient who actually pays the tax, there's no double taxation. The wealth that they receive, which can largely be viewed as an unearned advantage, as an unearned, uh, unearned uh, gain, wealth that they've not contributed to building, well, in their hands, it's only taxed once. Um, so those are. this is a summary of the arguments for and against, and I'll now hand over to Bethany, who will tell you more about how these taxes are designed and practiced in OECD countries and um, what some of their effects are. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm going to take you through some of the design features. This uh, section aligns with the third chapter in our report. Um, starting off with uh, the most sort of basic finding of the report, um, and that is that inheritance and estate taxes are very common across OECD countries. Currently, 24 of 37 OECD countries levy these taxes. Uh, previously, they were levied in a further 10 countries. Um, we're typically uh, looking at recipient-based inheritance taxes, which are levied on the beneficiary who receives the wealth, and which is the case in Germany. Two countries only, as the US and the UK, levy an estate tax on the don't wealth. And all countries with inheritance or estate taxes on uh, end-of-life wealth transfers also tax gifts, uh, which are wealth transfers made during the donor's life. Now, while inheritance and estate taxes are common, uh, they typically don't raise a lot of revenue. And you can see in the figure uh, that on average in these 24 countries, estate uh, inheritance and gift taxes altogether raise up just 0.5% uh, of total tax revenues. Germany, as you can see, very close to the OECD average, also raising about half a percent. Now, some countries do raise a little more uh, revenue. You can see on the right, there are four countries that raise more than 1% of tax revenues from inheritance taxes. But by and large, um, the revenue raising potential of these taxes is underutilized. So to understand why this is the case, uh, we can look a bit closer at the, the design of these taxes. And we'll start with tax exemption thresholds. If we could go to the next slide, please. When it comes to exemption thresholds, there are a lot of similarities across countries. The first is that spouses often benefit from the most preferential treatment. Um, this means in 13 countries, a full exemption, and in the remaining countries, the highest or second highest um, tax exemption threshold. In Germany, uh, the spouse can receive uh, about 500,000 <clears throat> 500, euros tax-free. The second commonality is that children uh, often benefit from either the most or second most preferential treatment on par with the spouse or just below. But a key difference across countries is the level of these exemption thresholds. You can see on the right that the exemption thresholds for the donor's children range from uh, about 17,000 US dollars to more than 11 million. Um, in Germany, Germany provides one of the larger um, exemption thresholds, which is uh, 400,000 euros. To compare with its neighbours, um, this is about four times higher than the threshold that applies in France. Returning to the similarities, uh, the third point is that uh, more distant relatives and also heirs that are not related to the donor typically have much less favourable tax treatment. In some countries, this means no tax exemption at all, uh, but Germany uh, has a small threshold of about 20,000 euros. Now, the design of these exemptions raises uh, some questions. In general, we find there is a case for exempting small transfers. As Sarah mentioned, this can have an equalizing effect on wealth inequality in the short run. Um, it can also increase the political acceptability of these taxes. 
there is a case for exempting or uh, providing a high tax exemption threshold for spouses. In part, uh, this is, doesn't appear to create additional avoidance opportunities and the wealth would eventually be taxed when it passes to the next generation, um, of course, assuming the, uh, the donor's children are not exempt. However, we find that there is a, that we should apply caution in designing these exemption thresholds. Uh, they can have a significant impact on the revenue potential of inheritance and estate taxes. Um, and they may also have negative distributional consequences by allowing large amounts of wealth to be passed tax-free and particularly to remain concentrated among close family members who benefit from the more generous balances. If we can move to the next slide. Uh, to look at the tax treatment of different assets. So in this figure, you can see how a broad range of asset classes uh, are taxed across countries. Um, we have uh, a few categories here. When we say tax preferentially, using teal, uh, what we mean is that special treatment is available for some heirs under specified conditions. And this is most common for the main residents and also for family businesses both of which uh, benefits from preferential treatment in Germany. And when we say exempt, and this is shown in orange, we mean that the assets are just not at all included, included in the tax base. And uh, this is most common for private pensions and for life insurance, uh, but neither of these are exempt in Germany. Now, as you can see from the figure, all countries apply as preferential treatment to one or more asset types. And this treatment can include full or partial exemptions, generous valuation rules, um, lower tax rates, payment deferrals. Um, this preferential treatment is typically conditional. Um, for example, tax relief might only be available to close family. Um, a beneficiary who's inheriting a main residence may have to continue living in it for a certain number of years. Um, now, as uh, with tax exemption thresholds, um, we find that there are cases where this uh, special uh, or preferential treatment is justified. Um, for example, um, uh, helping spouses, uh, particularly uh, potentially vulnerable older populations remaining in their homes. Um, however, these revenues do narrow the tax base. So uh, they can limit revenue potential, create distortions and avoidance opportunities. Um, and the benefit of these reliefs may be largely captured by wealthy households. And this undermines the progressivity of these taxes. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna focus for a moment on the tax treatment of business assets. Now, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, preferential treatment for business assets is common across countries. It can be more or less targeted to family businesses, um, although in some countries uh, it does apply to a very broad range of businesses. The most common uh, type of preferential treatment is a full or partial exemption, um, which is the case in Germany, but uh, other tax treatment may apply. Some countries, uh, not all countries, but some, um, apply conditions for the preferential treatment. Um, this can include, for example, uh, requiring management to be located within the country or within the European economic area, if we're talking about uh, European countries. The heirs may need to maintain the capital or the wage bill or even uh, work in the company uh, in a management role. Only a few countries cap the value of this relief or restrict eligibility to SMEs. And uh, yes, as for other assets, there may be a case for providing tax relief for business assets, uh, but as evidence shows that these reliefs may be progressive, um, it's, it's wise to apply caution. Um, we also find evidence that the relief uh, may not always be proportional to the stated goal of the provisions. Um, for example, ensuring that there is sufficient liquidity um, or uh, if it is the goal of the country to ensure the transfer of firms across generations. If you could go to the next slide, please. So the, the design of inheritance and estate taxes leads to these taxes uh, applying only to a minority of estates. 
Um, estates may be exempt for a few reasons, either the donor's wealth could fall under the exemption thresholds, they could distribute their wealth uh, to different beneficiaries in such a way that it's all uh, under their exemption thresholds, um, potentially leaving all of their wealth tax-free to charities in countries where this is an option. But whatever the reason, um, this figure shows that typically only a small share of estates are subject to inheritance or estate taxes. And in Germany, it's about one estate in 10. Next slide, please. So uh, once the wealth transfers are subject to tax, uh, how are they taxed? Well, about one third of countries apply flat tax rates, which is shown by a single dot in these figures. And the remaining two thirds apply uh, progressive rates, and this is shown um, in this figure with a maximum minimum with a line uh, joining the two. Nearly all countries with progressive rates, and in some countries with flat rates, um, there are different tax schedules applying uh, to the beneficiary depending on their relationship uh, with the donor. And as you can see in the figure, this means the closer the relation, the lower the tax rates. And this is also the case in Germany, uh, which applies three tax schedules. Uh, next slide, please. So we've covered inheritance and estate taxes, uh, but we also have uh, gift taxes, which are uh, applied to wealth transfers that are made during the donor's life. Um, I say gift taxes, this is the case for most countries, but there are two uh, countries that actually tax gifts through the personal income tax. Now, in countries, uh, in some countries, gift taxes align closely with inheritance and estate taxes. We might see the same tax rates, the same uh, preferential treatment for different assets. But um, generally, the tax treatment will differ depending on whether the wealth transfer was a gift or an inheritance. One significant difference between uh, gift taxes on the one hand, inheritance and estate taxes on the other, is the renewal of tax exemption thresholds. Uh, gift tax exemptions are uh, usually lower um, and uh, they renew, some cases they renew yearly, in other cases um, only every few years. In Germany, the thresholds are actually the same. Um, for the donor's children, you can pass on 400,000 euros uh, every 10 years. Um, or uh, at the time of inheritance. And what this means in Germany and in other countries is that households can transfer a significant amount of wealth over time tax-free by making regular transfers below the exemption thresholds. The taxpayers that are best placed to take advantage of this strategy are wealthy donors with liquid wealth. Uh, one final feature that uh, give taxes is uh, the possibility to separate bare ownership, um, which is the legal ownership of property without the, the income or the use of the asset from usufruct, which is the right to use or derive income from the property. Um, some countries uh, have a, a tax advantage applies in some countries where the bare ownership is taxed at the time of the transfer, uh, but the usufruct is not taxed uh, when it passes to the heir. Uh, other countries will actively discourage this arrangement by taxing full ownership uh, upfront when their ownership is transferred. Next slide, please. I've referred uh, a few times to avoidance uh, tax planning opportunities. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, a few more here uh, and touch on evasion as well. So as I've mentioned before, uh, taxpayers can make regular gifts. Um, transfer wealth to exempt or favorably taxed heirs, or transfer exempt or preferentially taxed assets um, to, to uh, avoid paying inheritance or estate taxes. Another avoidance opportunity arises from the tax treatment of capital gains, because in a number of countries, gains are taxed on a step up in basis where capital gains that accrue during the donor's life are forgiven upon their death and the beneficiary inherits the assets at market value. Um, in Germany, uh, unrealized gains are taxed on the carryover basis, which means that when the beneficiary sells the assets, uh, they're taxed on the gain that has accrued since the donor acquired it. 
Um, there is still an advantage here uh, because the beneficiaries can um, defer realization of the capital gains potentially indefinitely. Uh, and the final um, avoidance uh, or, or tax planning uh, opportunity arises from preferential valuation rules, for example, discounts for minority shareholding. Over to uh, tax evasion. There are a, a range of strategies from quite simple to more sort of complex, sophisticated strategies. Um, the first is uh, transferring difficult to trace assets. This could involve, for example, cash, moderate value jewelry. Um, the risk of theft would probably limit the value of assets that uh, taxpayers would try to transfer in this way. Um, another technique involves simply not declaring a transfer. Um, this is probably more difficult in cases where the ownership is notarized, like in the property. Um, taxpayers may also seek to uh, reduce the taxable value of their assets by inflating debt and allowable deductions. And finally, taxpayers may seek to conceal uh, their assets offshore. And this requires a bit more forethought and professional advice and some costs uh, that are associated with that strategy. Uh, and it is also becoming more difficult to do with the uh, expansion of uh, exchange of information networks. Um, so that brings me to the end of the discussion on tax design and I'll hand back to Sarah to uh, discuss the conclusions coming from this report. Um, thanks, Beth Bethany. So um, quickly, because I see that we're uh, uh, we took a lot of time, but um, overall, so the report concludes that inheritance and gift taxes can play an important role in enhancing quality of opportunity and in reducing uh, wealth gaps, in particular in the context of what we saw, which is persistently high wealth gaps, the unequal distribution of inheritances, and the likelihood that future trends in inheritances might further uh, reinforce wealth inequality. However, um, for wealth tax, for inheritance taxes to achieve their objective, they need to be well designed. And Bethany's part of the presentation just showed that that's not at all always the case. And so we argue from a tax design perspective that there's a particularly good case um, for a recipient based inheritance tax. So you tax the recipients rather than the donors on their estates and you exempt low value inheritances. There's one option that we talk about in the report, which would be particularly fair. Um, and that would be to, instead of taxing each wealth transfer separately, which is what almost all OECD countries do, um, to have a tax on lifetime wealth transfers. So that would be a tax on the overall amount of wealth that people receive uh, through the course of their life, whether it's through gifts and inheritances. So for instance, if you had two people um, who both received 300,000 euros as an inheritance, but one of the, these people actually received a boat in a house prior to that, well, that person would be subject to a much higher tax rate than the person who just received 300,000 euros. So you would look at previous wealth transfers received to determine the, the tax treatment of any new inheritance received. And that would be very fair because it would ensure that people who received more wealth over the course of their life would pay more in tax. And it would also limit tax planning opportunities because it wouldn't make a difference whether you receive the wealth as one big transfer or whether you receive it as small transfers spread out over time. But we also recognize that it's obviously challenging to levy these types of taxes, but there's still um, an interesting option for governments to look at if they're uh, concerned about equity and wealth inequality. We also highlight the importance of country context, and we highlight the fact, and that's important, that inheritance taxes are not a silver bullet. If you want to raise a significant amount of revenue, and if you want to address wealth, in, wealth inequality, inheritance taxes are an important tool, but you'll need other tools. You'll need other taxes, and you'll also need tools that, for example, help those at the bottom acquire wealth and, and save, and those are most likely not going to be tax measures. So you need a combination of tools. Now, next slide, please. So those are some of our additional recommendations. So exempting small inheritances, we talked about it, having progressive tax rates um, to enhance vertical equity, um, avoiding excessive gaps in tax treatment between wealth transfers to direct descendants and wealth transfers to other heirs, better aligning uh, the tax treatment of gifts and inheritances, 
Um, tax reliefs for which there's no strong rationale or which tend to be regressive could be scaled back. That would be tax relief for insurance, uh, life insurance policies or private pension savings, for example. Carefully designing and considering uh, relief for business assets and potentially capping the value of relief, limiting opportunities for tax planning, allowing taxes to be paid in installments or to be deferred under certain conditions to avoid liquidity issues. Um, closely looking at the interaction between inheritance taxes and capital gains taxes to prevent that some unrealized gains at death fully escape taxation. And then finally, making sure that when there are cross-border or international inheritances, countries better align their taxing rights and provide adequate double tax relief. So that's um, it. Next slide, please. That's it for the presentation. Those are the links to the full report in English. English and to two shorter brochures in French and in English. Um, and we look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Well, thanks, Bethany and Sarah. Uh, always good to have uh, an overview on what happens in other countries and how uh, it seems all countries seem to be struggling with a good design of uh, uh, for these taxes. Now, Roland Franke, um, let me turn to you, um, probably a lot of food for thought, lot, probably also a few areas where you would like to respond, uh, in particular, maybe on the, on the question to what extent uh, inheritance are good uh, managers of uh, companies they inherit. Uh, that's one part, but I would like to start off with a broader question. Given the fact that Germany is a country which is taxing at a very high level labor, and uh, as we have seen as a, at a rather low level wealth and also inheritance. Is there not a case in general that we should shift some of the burden from labor to inheritance, both from an economic uh, efficiency point of view, but also from a point of view uh, to uh, uh, reduce inequality? Well, thank you very much for this question and thank you. Uh, very much um, to the presenters for the presentation. Well, there was a lot of statistical material and many things were not um, hinting really in just one direction. Well, when, when I think about um, inheritance tax, um, my studies always come back into my mind and I had one uh, tax law professor who ironically uh, proposed to have a 100% tax rate for inheritance tax because this would solve any, quest, uh, any, any problems. You wouldn't have to transfer anything anymore. And we would be quite close to what has been mentioned several times today, the equality of opportunity. But I doubt the, that um, taking away something from somebody, which is a relative disadvantage. Um, if it really helps the one uh, who doesn't receive any, anything, because at first it comes to the state and then I get a little bit closer to your question. Yes, we have high taxes. We do not only have high taxes with regard to labor. We also have uh, high taxes for businesses. Um, also relatively in, in, in the OECD and um, we are in a high tax country and it has been mentioned in one of the last slides that um, inheritance taxation shall always be seen in a country context and this is um, uh, really necessary and we have other things to take into account. Um, let me remind you of the Gilets Jaunes in France. We, we didn't have such a movement in Germany, which may also be because of this other structure we have. You already mentioned um, this, uh, um, the crown jewels uh, of the German economy, uh, often called the hidden champions. They are not only in, 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 in capitals and metropolitan areas, they are often in, in very uh, rural parts of Germany. And so uh, the opportunity to earn a good living is spread all over the country in Germany. You do not have to be in the capital like uh, in, 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 in Paris or in London to, to do certain things. You can do it almost everywhere in the country. 
And um, we also have seen that um, especially family businesses in East Germany have had an important role in stabilizing uh, that part of the country in the last 30 years with a, 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 a proportion of family businesses even higher than in the western parts of Germany. So I think that we have good reason to take care of the business model as a country that we have with all those hidden champions. And you, you mentioned <laughs> the more or less successful successor. Yes, of course, people are different and sometimes um, it, it may be right that the successor is not as successful as his predecessor, but I also know um, cases where it's the other way around, where successors have really developed what they have inherited. So um, I don't think that um, inheritance taxation should be used to push um, a development that uh, um, leads to the transfer of businesses to whomever. It, we, we have a model that really works and we should therefore um, continue uh, the, the, the regulation idea that we have in inheritance taxation. But just to come just to come back to this last point, um, as uh, my colleagues have shown, the the the, the share of uh, wealth which is inherited is growing. It is also growing in Germany, and it's going to grow over the next years. Is there not a is this not a case for looking taking a closer look at inheritance tax? Also, because wealth concentration at the top is not a it's not, not only a question of economic inequality; it's also a question of what impact it does have on the political system, on the society as large. So uh, don't you think that the situation we are in now with a growing uh, volume of inheritance and many of the large uh, uh, fortunes which are passed on are actually enshrined within family businesses. So is that not an argument for, you know, taking a closer look at that part of taxation and uh, using it to equalize uh, the society and to, I mean, to put it, uh, you know, provocative, pro pro in a provocative way, you know, to, to reduce the risk that we end up in a plutocratic situation where only the rich can sort of not only stay rich, but also uh, tweak the, the political system in, into their direction. Uh, I, I don't think that um, we have such a static development. Of course, we should always encourage entrepreneurship and we will always see new businesses coming up and we should allow them to grow. Um, I, I think that there are countries in the world where the concentration of wealth uh, is a problem, but I do not see them that much in OECD countries and especially not in this way in Germany. I mean, if, if, if uh, uh, a, a large part of um, all agricultural um, facilities is owned by uh, very few people in a country. This may be a problem, but if we have um, 1,000 hidden, hidden champions, then I don't see uh, that there is a kind of a dynastic uh, problem. Okay, thank you. Um, Stefan Bach, um, you have uh, argued in the past that um, inheritance tax is the best way to tax the rich. <laughs> um, but um, I mean, I think you would probably agree with most of the, well, tell us if you agree with most of what you what we just heard from, from the report, but I would also like to add one additional question, which uh, is always also important when it comes to inheritance tax. It is that if you look at uh, 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 surveys, uh, it seems to be highly unpopular uh, among uh, the population in Germany. You know, the surveys I have looked up, uh, they, they talk about 70% of people say the inheritance tax is unfair. And interesting enough, uh, um, people who don't inherit anything find them unfairer than those who, uh, who receive wealth through inheritance. So what, do we, what are we making of this situation where there might be an economic case for uh, inheritance tax, but uh, 
uh, on a, from a social perspective, there might be less so because people don't think that this is a good idea. Yeah, thank you, Matthias, and uh, thank you very much uh, to the colleagues from the OECD for this very fruitful overview on uh, inheritance taxation in the OECD country. Um, yeah, I mean, inheritance, okay, I mean, I think there is a gap between the economics perspective on wealth taxation and the perspective of the broader public. Uh, I mean, in, in our economic um, in uh, 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 economics, mostly saying that the inheritance tax or estate taxes or even inheritance tax, as the colleagues argued, is the best way to tax wealth, uh, in particular high wealth at the top, let's say, of the top 1% or 0.5% of the population, uh, because it represents meritocracy. It does not distort so much capital accumulation. It is um, more, it, it, it does not cost so much in administrative, uh, 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 administrated uh, for it. So, um, but the broader public inheritance taxation is rather unpopular because people think that they are affected by it, whereas recurrent wealth taxation and capital income taxation is, or even business taxation is more popular at the, in, the, in the broader public. So, I mean, if you look at our, in Germany, we have now, we have a, in, in, in September, we have the federal elections and the poll campaigns are going on and there's a tax policy plays a role, is some issue, but, and even wealth taxation is an issue. But if you look at the left-wing parties like Social Democrats and Greens and uh, left party, they also, they, they all endorse wealth taxation, the reinvention of the recurrent wealth taxation, but they have only uh, very little and um, not really, uh, some, some, some very little plans on inheritance taxation in particular with respect to the to the to the mentioned privileges for 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 for, for firm continuations, which are very high, which have a very high impact on on this. We have a high revenue effect. So we also recommend to reduce uh, these very high um, uh, privileges and um, uh, 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 reliefs in order to to increase to raise more more revenue and uh, to to maybe to. To, 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 to also to use tax rates or personal allowances. Perfect, thank you. Brings me back to Bethany and uh, Sarah. Uh, have you looked at this issue of um, uh, popularity of uh, uh, inheritance tax? And uh, I mean, there's a strong economic argument you're putting forward, but if uh, people don't think it's a good idea, it's probably not gonna fly politically, is it? Um, yes, yeah, so we didn't uh, we we didn't talk about this in the presentation, but we have a whole section um, in in the third chapter of our report on on the political economy, um, and and inheritance taxation is the one of the most hated taxes in many OECD countries. So it is it is a big issue, and and we recognize that, and we try to see what are the ways in which these political constraints that are associated with um, inheritance tax from what, what could be ways of addressing that. And we cite a few um, recent studies that are very interesting and that show in particular that if you tell people, um, if you give them information about the level of wealth inequality in their country, suddenly inheritance taxes and other forms of capital taxation at the personal level become more popular. So there is a, a lack of information, I think, on inequality levels, that's one thing. The other thing is what uh, you were saying, Matthias, is there is um, there are misconceptions about how inheritance taxes work, about um, you know, who, they apply to, who they apply to and how much people think they'll end up paying in tax. And generally it's always overestimated. And so there are also studies that show that when you tell people how it works and who ends up being affected and by how much, um, inheritance taxes also become more acceptable by, by the general public. So clear information on inequality on tax design is very important. Um, clear messaging also around uh, the, the, what the purpose is and addressing inequality and increasing equality of opportunity is also key when you're, when you're trying to pass a reform. 
And also, you need, if you're going to plan an inheritance tax reform, you actually need to plan a reform that addresses some of people's legitimate concerns, like tax avoidance. If you're going to potentially raise inheritance taxes, well, you need to, at the same time, uh, make sure that you're preventing avoidance opportunities because these are people's concerns and their legitimate concerns. Um, can I also just react on the point that was made uh, by uh, Roland on, on uh, family-owned businesses? Um, so as Bethany was saying, basically there, and, and Bethany might add also, she, she has thoughts on this as well. Um, so she showed that basically they benefit from preferential tax treatment in, in, in most countries. And often it's attached with some requirements for business continuity, which makes sense. Um, the issue there is that um, there is evidence that these types of reliefs are widely regressive and that they end up benefiting at the very top of the distribution. So we're not actually saying that we should get rid of any support for family owned businesses, but we're saying that it should probably be targeted at the businesses that really need it. And those are gonna be the smaller businesses. Um, and so it's about thinking about measures to cap the value of the relief or to better target the relief and to closely monitor who benefits from it. But there's limited justification for unlimited, unkept support because among the family business community, there are actually really big businesses that can deal with uh, large inheritance tax bills. And I just want to cite to um, on that point, there's the Samsung case that just came out recently. So the Samsung heirs are going to face, are facing an inheritance tax bill of $12 billion. It is the largest inheritance tax bill ever recorded. And what the Samsung family said is that they will be able to pay over five years this amount. And they're gonna do a mix of borrowing, a mix of higher dividend payments. They're gonna to have to in indeed divest a little bit from some of their holdings, but this is probably good from a competition perspective. They're giving all of their artwork to museums in South Korea. So I'm just saying, I think there is a case for smaller businesses clearly, but we need to think about potentially, um, you know, thinking about capping or, or making sure it targets the right businesses. And final point on that, for the businesses that do have to pay, there are other measures. You can have tax deferral, you can have tax payment in installments. And if your tax rates aren't excessively high, these go a long way towards ensuring that big businesses can actually pay um, their, their tax burden. So I just wanted to make that, that point clear, but maybe Bethany has something to add as well. Um, yeah, I think Sarah, you've covered um, most of the points uh, that I would want to raise. Um, I'll just say one, one short comment is I, I think it's important to distinguish between the survival of the firm and the continuation of the firm within the family hands. Um, whether uh, a firm is able to survive uh, a transfer will depend uh, on what uh, other assets the heirs may have inherited, um, whether some of these other assets can be, uh, can be used to, to pay this tax. Um, if uh, in the end the business is, is uh, sold uh, in order to pay the tax, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is divestment or that there's loss of employment. Um, some of these countries, uh, some of these companies, sorry, as Sarah has mentioned, are uh, quite attractive. Um, some of them will uh, be, be a little bit more difficult to find uh, external investors for. Um, some firms that are, for example, quite small with uh, low liquidity or that are not particularly profitable um, or for which there is extremely specialized uh, knowledge or skills that's difficult to replicate uh, with, uh, with a, a wider, wider um, set of investors. But uh, I think many firms uh, will have options um, and many heirs will have options in order to address this. Um, and the tax authorities themselves have options to, to address this uh, issue with liquidity, um, which is the, the real threat to the continuation survival of the businesses. Um, deferrals can play uh, an important role here, um, but there's also a, a case for um, where you're rolling back these uh, preferential treatments, where you're broadening the base, you may have the option to lower the rates. Um, and a broad based low rate inheritance may be easier for uh, businesses to, uh, to pay. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think, uh, Matthias, you have something to say. 
Well, thanks, thanks both of you. Well, I would like to pass this question obviously to Roland Franke and ask him whether this, uh, what we've seen with Samsung could not be possible in Germany. Well, we are actually not so far from that. We haven't seen a, a 12 billion uh, bill, but uh, we have in the media at the moment, the cases of Karl Eri van Haup and, uh, and Sam Antile. And we see that the Haupt family had to face a major restructuring to cope with the um, tax debt. And if, as far as I can follow that from the media, uh, Heinz Hermann Thiele has more or less built up uh, two enterprises. One is Knorr Bremse that the family will keep. And the other one is uh, more uh, diverse and will be more or less sold, perhaps including his Lufthansa engagement. But uh, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't think that uh, one should make this um, the, the, the goal for every entrepreneur, that you have to have two enterprises to be able to transfer one to your successors. In some, in some cases it, it works, and of course there are always um, successful entrepreneurs who can cope with any situations, but uh, we should not make it too difficult. And there is one other question I would, uh, one other point I would like to mention. We already have a cap for very high um, inheritances, even for business assets. We have, um, um, an allowance only up to 26 million, which is for uh, uh, any normal citizen quite a lot of money. But if you see it uh, in terms of, of, of business assets, it's not very much. It, con it, it, it corresponds to uh, a little bit more than um, or even less than 2 million um, um, uh, profit per year, which is a rather small company. So if you if you really have very large companies, then you already have those problems with the cap at the top. And um, if the successors were not able to cope with these situations and to then develop the the enterprise successfully, we would not have these large enterprises. What we do have then, sometimes in the fifth, sixth, or even more uh, generation. So uh, I still <laughs> advocate for this business model. And I, I, do, I don't think that it's impossible to, to modify uh, the uh, um, inheritance taxation rules we have. But we should make sure that they are not more burdensome than they already are. And we already have some um, points in uh, the inheritance tax law uh, where something is definitely going wrong. Uh, I just want to mention the 90% test where uh, gross and net values are mixed together in a way that it doesn't work. And uh, apparently uh, the financial court of Münster is already on the way to Karlsruhe with that. Thank you. I just want to go back to another aspect and ask Stefan Bach about it. It's coming from the chat, actually, um, which is um, a question of, it goes back maybe to the interim, to the question of uh, how popular, unpopular inheritance tax is. Uh, is there, from your perspective, a lack of information we have about wealth? I mean, the wealth statistics are not very, very good in, in, in Germany and many countries. Some countries like Switzerland have good wealth statistics because they have a wealth tax. Um, so a question to you would be, would it be better to have more information or would that help? Or do you think that this would not really have an impact on uh, the acceptance of inheritance tax? I think more information would be helpful in any case, in particular in terms of tax statistics and um, statistics of um, business structures and uh, particularly on um, statistics on households with very high net wealth in Germany. There, there's no so, that much information in, in um, Germany. Even the case we already discussed on the 
efficiency, equity issues on firms continuation and business assets. Uh, I mean, this is in, in the end, it's an empirical question. Uh, the dis discussion is, 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 is clear. There's some theoretical and uh, distributional arguments against this high reliefs. On the other hand, we have to take into account what Mr. Franke uh, mentioned that uh, we have uh, this um, structures, business structures, business culture of the German Mittelstand, and we have to consider the effects uh, of uh, firm uh, inheritance taxation and firm continuation, but we should have more empirical evidence on how firm continuation really succeeds uh, uh, or, or does not succeed um, because we do not have uh, financial accounting information for these firms because they they are not uh, they, they have uh, disclosure privileges they do not uh, uh, publish their financial accountings mm -hmm. we do not know so so much in, in 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 germany so i think to come to the end i mean um, more information would be better but i think there's an the other aspect is that many people fear, I mean, many people think they might be richer or the children might be get richer. So they are reluctant with inheritance taxation, but to tax high wealth or high capital income mm -hmm. is more attractive to, 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 to the broader public, I think. Thanks. And, and there's an important uh, a supplement here in the chat, which says that uh, if we look at wealth, uh, we should also look at the pension wealth, uh, uh, which should be included, which is difficult to, to assess. It's not usually not included in the wealth statistics. So that's an important complement. But there we have two questions also about the, 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 the role of foundations uh, in order to reduce uh, inheritance tax. Maybe Sarah or Bethany, would you like to elaborate on this? Uh, because that seems to be one other strategy to reduce uh, the tax bill on inheritance, to you know, put everything in a foundation and then not having to pass on anything from one generation to the other. And uh, how do you assess this um, form? Is this fine or is there what are the caveats around this so uh, foundations if you could uh, maybe i'll just I, I think bethany is looking to this more more closely but um we do cover in the report these possibilities of going through special structures whether it's foundations or trust actually we focus quite a bit on trusts and the information we got is the information we got from um, oecd countries we asked them to report what were the, these types of strategies um, I'm, I'm not sure what the specific setup in Germany is, but there seems to be an avenue there. Um, this is typically something that needs to be addressed um, because often there is a justification at the, at the very beginning for the, for the measure, um, but then it's used in ways that policymakers didn't intend from the beginning. And this is typically when you know we're talking about making sure that inheritance taxation is less unpopular. It's making sure that there aren't these ways. Um, I mean, in certain instances, it might make sense, but when there's clear abuse, this is something that needs to be looked into closely. And it's something that we highlight in, in our report. Again, I think we, we have more information about trust and, and it's a more common system in the US or uh, in the UK, but maybe Bethany has a bit more on, on foundations. Um, so, as Sarah mentioned, we did look into this um, in some uh, in some detail, and we're focusing more on uh, trusts now. Um, as as far as the German foundation structure goes, I understand that there is a periodic uh, tax or a periodic realization of gains after about thirty years, um, but I'm not sure what the situation is in terms of the transfer. Uh, where the person who has placed the assets in the foundation uh, upon their death, I'm, I'm not sure what the tax treatment is in that case. Um, but as Sarah mentioned, the, the real issue here is where these, um, where these structures obscure uh, ownership or they entirely conceal it, uh, or they allow uh, somebody to retain ownership while another person receives those benefits. Um, 
for countries that would like to address this issue, um, we can look, for example, to the, uh, the example in the United Kingdom, where previously trusts were used quite extensively in order to reduce uh, uh, what they call the inheritance tax, which is actually an estate tax, um, but in order to reduce uh, the, the tax liability, trusts were used quite extensively. Um, and the uh, application of a charge on wealth that is put in to the, uh, the trust and then every seven years, again, paying a, a certain charge, this uh, is intended to uh, bring the burden uh, on assets that are within the foundation in line with assets that are uh, outside of the trust and that are passed along at inheritance. So uh, there are options for this. Um, I would just mention uh, as well on the question of pension wealth. Um, in the report, uh, so in the, in the figures that I provide, we indeed are only looking at private pension wealth. Now, this is quite important in uh, my home country of Australia, where uh, we have private pension savings accounts, um, but in uh, other countries where this is optional, uh, they might not be quite so important. Um, we, in the report, looked as well at what we call extended net wealth, which includes the value of occupational pensions. This uh, increased uh, mean wealth in some countries, not a lot, um, but unfortunately we don't have measures of household wealth that include state pensions. So this uh, might be the, the minimum pension that uh, you would receive without having um, contributed. Uh, or with uh, only, only uh, minimal uh, requirements like residency. Um, these statistics, unfortunately, we, we are not able to access. Uh, and uh, well, we, we question um, what this would, what impact this would have on uh, wealth transfer taxes, because indeed you, you can't necessarily transfer your pension rights to another person, even if there are survivor pensions uh, in place. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. It's well, it's it's a tricky question how to deal with these uh, pension pension rights, and I think there are arguments for both sides. Um, I think I would. Uh, we have still a few questions in the chat which we haven't been able to answer, but I would suggest that we close the plenary session now, uh, maybe a bit abruptly. But I hope you appreciate the the second part uh, uh, of uh, of the event or the third part which would be sort of a discussion, a more informal discussion in the break, breakout rooms. And uh, my colleague Georg will show you real quick how you will be able to get into the breakout rooms. So it's basically you use the, at the bottom of your um, screen, there is at the right, there is a button. Um, 